Welcome to the Trailblazers Impact Podcast, a groundbreaking new podcast that explores the transformative journeys of contemporary female history makers, from the civil rights era in the 1960s to overcoming LGBTQ discrimination, gender bias, and racial discrimination in today's world. I'm Nan McKay, and Dee Dee Strum and I interview women and a few men to bring you the aspirational stories of fearless women entrepreneurs, authors, attorneys, executives, community leaders, and mothers who have blazed a trail for others to follow. Get your dose of can-do empowerment today. Trailblazers Impact Podcast is featured in the top 20 Trailblazers Trendsetters Podcast by Feedspot and is one of the top 28 podcasts for women in their 20s by Pretty Progressive. Visit our website, trailblazersimpact.com, and listen to all three of our podcasts. Subscribe using the link on our website to receive our newsletter with featured podcasts. Love what you hear? then please share our episodes on your social media sites and shop for all your Amazon needs through the link on our website, trailblazersimpact.com, to help support the podcast. I would like to introduce you today to Christine Markey. While attending music school, Christine went for a singing audition in a four-star hotel and got the job. After spending three years with that hotel, she was offered a job singing with the dance band on Queen Elizabeth II, a cruise ship. She performed a cabaret act and then met her now husband, Tony Markey, also a singer. Tony took one look at her and said, that's the woman for me. They joined together as a duo and finally landed a position on several cruise ships for about 20 years. So we're going to find out about this wonderful life. Welcome, Christine Markey. (laughs) Thank you. Your husband said, that's the woman for me. Did you (laughs) immediately fall in love with him as well? Well, I like the look of him. (laughs) (laughs) I thought I have to get to know him first because he was from London. I'd come all the way up to Newcastle, which is the northeast. So, But I liked him immediately, and then we got on immediately. So then gradually turned it new. 27 years of marriage and 30-odd years together. You had a lot in common with your singing careers. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true, yeah. And then being able to have a duo. Well, that was the ideal way, because he was singing with a trio, and they toured around Europe, Um, and then they broke up, and we wanted to be together. So we said, well, let's put a duo act together. Let's do it ourselves. And Yeah, so that worked out perfectly. And then we wanted to work on cruise ships together, so we spent two years because you've got to get to know the agents, you have to get to auditions, and eventually landed a, a very nice job with a Greek ship called Stella Solaris, which doesn't exist anymore. But we loved that, and that went from there on to Seabourn, where we did about three or four years. And then we did Cunard, p and just the usual round of ships, and just loved it. And when you go home, you're very restless, because you want to be back on the ship again and singing places and meeting new people all the time, which is excellent. Now, you got the first <clears throat> cruise ship job, though, right? With q yeah. too. Well, that was look. Someone saw me singing in the hotel and said, oh, they're looking for a girl singer. Would you fancy it? <laughs> oh, all right, then. <laughs> and the first cruise was one month, at the time, that's all, one month Caribbean cruise at Christmas time. So I said, oh, all right then. And it was the most wonderful time. I'd never even been away from home up until that point. And then, of course, when I came home, oh, I was so restless, pacing the floor, thinking, what am I going to do? And then luckily the band leader phoned and said, would you like the job permanently? Yes, when can I start? (laughs) (laughs) Now, how old were you when you went on your first cruise ship? Um, I must have been 22, maybe. Seems about right, about yeah. About 22? Yeah. And what did your parents think about that? They just sort of, well, if that's what you want to do, and they would support me any in anything I wanted to do. They never said, no, you have to get a proper job. Did they worry about you going off by yourself oh, all probably. over the world? <laughs> probably, but they, they just encouraged me. 
And I wrote, in those days, we didn't have mobile email, so I wrote letters constantly, and every port I went into sent postcards home. So we all, I always kept in touch. And every now and then you could get letters at a, whichever port you went to. That was, that was much easier these days. Now, were you homesick? In the very beginning, or did you? Yeah, just... on that first Christmas cruise, I was, especially when it came to Christmas. Christmas yeah. And I thought, oh, no, I don't like being away from home. But I was having such a good time. So you, you just have to balance it, don't you, really? Go back in your mind. Tell me about that first time. Out of my experience. I mean, I'd sang in a hotel, but, but you saw the same people every week, every day. And then you suddenly go... And especially on the QE2, which was so luxurious, and it was it opened a whole new life. All these different accents, which this is part of the one I love about being on a ship, is the people you meet from all the different countries, different accents, and you learn so much. And the, I mean, the Caribbean was wonderful. I mean, all I'd been to the, on a beach at home, <laughs> and I live in the northeast of England where it's always cold. <laughs> so this was just so weird something I'd never, ever done, and it was just fabulous. And you took to it like a duck Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I was terrified that first week on there, and I had to... I knew a lot of songs. After working for six nights a week in a hotel, I'd learned a lot of songs, but then all of a sudden, instead of just three people behind you, you've got a 12-piece orchestra behind you, and I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What if I can't, what if I can't sing in tune, or what if I can't get in in the right place? All these things go through your mind so I must have been terrified I must have looked terrified <laughs> with my knees knocking together and <laughs> but it was just so such an experience were you a soloist yes in the beginning oh well yes but there was there were two boy singers and me and um, so they made it easier because it was one of the male singers who had seen me singing at home and um, who got me the job so he encouraged me and I said oh god I said what if I'm really bad what if I can't and he said of course you can I've seen you singing don't be so stupid. <laughs> oh, all right, then. Well, if you think I can do it, huh? maybe I can. So what was it like back then? Because cruising all those years ago, I think, must have been very different than it is today. Yeah. The people, how they dressed. Well, that was the... a very formal ship. So the QE2, you had to be nearly, I think most nights were formal nights, from what I can remember. This was back in 1980 when I was on the QE2. So everything was very formal and you had very strict rules. So there were certain, like, I was never allowed in the casino, which didn't bother me, to be fair. On the QE2, you had the two different rooms and there was the Queen's room at the top and then there was a door you went through and that was first class, which we never went through. We entertained. So there was the two sections. I don't think that exists anymore that sort of the two classes sort of first class yeah first class and second and class I suppose yeah steerage yeah whatever you want to call it yeah not as bad as it was on the Titanic <laughs> so when you think of do you watch the Titanic I yeah think, oh so. yeah was it a lot like that yeah that's even longer ago I think I can't remember oh yeah how far back that went but yeah 1913 so, oh really it was way it's a long back. time ago okay. yeah over 100 years. And yet, it ha probably hadn't changed that much, had it? With the no, formality? No, it was all, yeah. And, and very, you had strict rules that you had to stick to, which is always, for an, any ship, there has to be rules. But I never felt confined by anything. I knew you, you don't go in, through that door, which is, sounds weird now. The first but class door. Yeah. But I was with, the, there was 12 musicians in the band, the band leader, and there were six dancers and they was they were lovely because it was they didn't have a cast as such where they have now. They brought entertainers on board all the time, so you saw different people all the time, and the dancers were lovely. So you had a nice little. We all lived in the same area, so you had a nice atmosphere going, and people and all doing the same job, and more did or less. Everybody stay in the same <clears throat> ship for the whole time. Yes, and well, those it was six month contracts, but. Was the same, but well, the same band leader for the three years. Most of the same musicians. Once they tend to get on and yet enjoy the job, you tend to stay there, unless you need to go home for something. And some people want to change. You would get new musicians in who were in the National Jazz Youth Orchestra or something. They would come on just for a month, for the experience. So that was fun because you were getting, 
you know, young kids who could play really well. And that's what the band leader loved. And it kept all his music alive as well, so it was really good. And back then, people really danced a lot, didn't they? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Well, we every cruise, you started off with the young know, fox trots, the quick steps, all the normal stuff. And one cruise, everybody would be on the dance floor and the atmosphere would be fabulous. And they'd every night they danced. And then the next cruise, nobody would get on the dance floor and you'd be doing the same things. It, why did all these people get together <laughs> at one time? And we we talked about that and the band leader said, There's, we never know why. Sometimes it's hard, you've got to pull them on and persuade them. And other times, they're straight there. So tell me about what the women wore. Oh, you have beautiful clothes. Because you've got very classy people on there. But I remember one lady, she got very upset one night. She was I was sitting with her and her husband and their friends. And she got very upset and I said, oh, is something wrong? Can I get you a drink of water? Saying, no, no, there's a man on the dance floor and his jacket is unbuttoned. <laughs> oh, and that was what she was upset about. She was upset and I thought, oh, dear, this is not a world I, <laughs> don't, I know anything about. <laughs> so on the dance floor, did the first class passengers and the other class, yeah. did they mix? There was one dance floor and one deck, and then you went up another deck, where, which was the, the Queen's Room, with the bigger dance floor, um, because then the show would be performing on one and then on the next one, next deck. So it was just all separate, but it was just very funny that because it, it was another lifestyle that you learned that these people lived. And, and especially um, this one man said, oh, yes, we went for a wonderful meal. It was in New York, and he said... Each course, you got up from the table and you went to the next room. <laughs> now, let me think about wow. that. Wow. So, was it like a buffet? Or... No, no. Oh, it was like a seven-course meal, but you oh. just changed rooms. So, so you didn't have course. to have... Yeah. <laughs> and did you weird. change partners at the table? Then? Well, oh, I didn't ask about that. <laughs> oh, I presume you went with the people that you were with. <laughs> Well, I was just thinking they probably had set tables back yeah. then where you always sat with the same people. Yes. And I'm wondering if they then took that group and went to the next room. Yeah, that seemed to be how, how we were saying it. And I said, wow. It's different. But does it not get up? <laughs> you think, oh, God, I'm going to get up after that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, it was something new and yeah. it was different. So I suppose when you're, you're so used to going out and having meals out, that's something different to do. Can you think of one situation that really sticks in your mind as I'm an experience? Too. Oh, God, there are so many. Oh, that's a really tricky one. <laughs> I'm trying to get my brain working now. That's hard, you know. It gets harder for me every year. I know. Yes, I do <laughs> know. I've got such a bad memory. <laughs> I think it was maybe when they brought people on to talk and um, because they had wonderful cabaret acts on, but there was they would bring on... <laughs> forgotten his name he was in um Gigi the actor in Gigi was, was Duv no Duval no oh man I've got such a bad memory wish my friend was here she knows all yeah that. but he came on and he was telling so you would get people like that who could tell you their life stories and what they'd done and he'd we'd worked with all these wonderful stars I wish I could think of his name. But then the trouble is, you couldn't shut him up. <laughs> so, so the cruise director kept looking at us watching. Oh, OK. <laughs> How late in the, at night? I mean, what were your hours? Oh, well, I think you were, so, you were contracted for, say, 4, 45 minutes. I mean, he didn't sing that whole time. But it meant that if he needed you, then you had to be ready. On an embarkation day, you were there in all your finery, always formal. And then you might be singing at five o'clock for a sail away party or something. And then we would do three sets minimum. And then the oh, you would get invited to cocktail parties, which was very nice. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> but you had to have, luckily I had worked in a four-star hotel before, so I had enough nice gowns to be able to go on the QE2. Otherwise I would have had to spend a fortune on clothes which I'd gathered over the three years in the hotel and did most of the women wear full length yes yeah, so the, oh there was some beautiful clothes and just people with such style but it was wonderful to and you met people like there was an um, American diplomat came on 
with his wife and two children. Oh, man, they were so... You think when you say movies, you say beautiful people, and they were beautiful people. But I sat with their two sons once, and they brought an act on. It was three girls doing all the um, boogie boogie boogle boy, you know, all that stuff. And one of the girls was a little bit... Uh, uh, well, her costume was tight, put it that way. <laughs> and this little boy, who was about eight, went, oh... Um, her, her clothes are rather tight, aren't they? <laughs> Which made me laugh so much. And then his mother said, what did you... I can't do an American accent. And then she started to laugh. I said, you see, eight-year-old, he's got it all up there. <laughs> and you never know what's going to come out of yeah. your mouth. Now, contrast that to what's yeah. different about cruising hmm. today. I would say a lot of it's the same. We're less formal now. But I put that down to the amount of cases you can now take on an airplane. Because people would arrive on the QE2 with trunkfuls of clothes. One ship we did, every year, the big ships, they don't, I don't think they do it now, they used to do January to March was the world cruise. So they went all round. And people would book two cabins or two suites. And in the next suite, all their clothes, two sizes up, would be already in the wardrobe. So halfway through the world cruise, they would just move their suite. <laughs> Two sizes up. Can you imagine? <laughs> well, because you can imagine how they would, the food. And, I mean, th those days they always had midnight buffets, which they don't do anymore, because it's quite often it was usually a lot, it was just the band, <laughs> the band and the, and the entertainment department, because most people went to bed early-ish, so Midnight Buffet, while it was very extravagant and looked beautiful, I think they re realised down the line that it was a bit of a waste of time and money. But we don't do Midnight Buffets anymore. And less formal now, when we worked on Seabourne, that was six, five or six nights a week was formal night. So you always were dressed. Whereas now they say, especially on, on here, it's smart casual. You obviously can't go into dinner in shorts and a T-shirt, but it's more relaxed. And if you want to get dressed up, you can. A lot of people, you still see some beautiful gowns that people come on, but you've only got 23 kilos, <laughs> quite often 23 kilos each. So that cut down a lot, on the I think, on the amount of pe things people brought with them. Is that like 30 pounds or...? Oh, yeah, I think so. Because we don't know what kilos Oh, is. sorry. <laughs> Say again, Tony well, would know that answer. Probably about 30 Probably, pounds, yeah. maybe more, yeah. but 50, up to maybe yeah. 50. I mean, you see in the old days when they used to arrive, when you see on the, on the old movies, and they arrive with big, big trunks, <laughs> these poor crew members have to carry up the, the scanway. And if you think they had silk things, a lot was because that sort of fabrics that they wore, you couldn't just put those in the laundry. You could wear them once and then you had to have something different every day. So they didn't have like a dry cleaners on board? Not No, not dry cleaning. They would wash like normal laundry, but they'd be terrified. Can you imagine if you ruined a gown that was worth like $5,000? Yeah. <laughs> so they just brought enough clothes so they could yeah. just keep changing. Yeah. So what? where would a round-the-world <clears throat> cruise go? Uh, well, quite often it would start in Southampton. I know the QE2, that's mm -hmm. where it started. Then you'd go around via Gibraltar and all around. You'd end up... We did places like um, Pitcairn Island and Easter Island. So you'd, you'd, you'd generally... The circle, I think they always did a circle one way and then maybe the next year they'd circle the other way around the world. So what and countries would you go to on that? Would you go to places like Well, you would India? just hit about everywhere, yeah, yeah. Because you would go around Europe, but you would cross over, go around America, and you go around the Caribbean, lots of those ports, through the Panama Canal. So we always did Mediterranean. I would imagine they would pick them for the weather. And so they would probably start off, do the crossing over to the American side, the Caribbean, where you knew you'd get sunshine, <laughs> and then leave the Mediterranean through the Panama Canal. Mediterranean maybe a bit later, but you always did like you had pyramids and I was just so just endless. I've got wonderful photographs as you can imagine. I had to buy a camera specially, <laughs> and you still have them in your scrapbook. Yeah, oh yes. But when you look now to what the photographs you can take now, and I, it was an Olympus trip, which might have been a new camera then, and I look at something I would have oh sailing into Sydney. 
on the QE2 because of was being the QE2. You sail into Sydney and anybody in that area who has a, a boat, whether it's a little rowing boat or the yacht or whatever, all sailed in with the ship there to greet it. And when you sailed out, they were there back again. And the firework display, because it was a because it was the QE2, basically. So that was always ah, fabulous. Now, was that the only cruise ship back then? I can't remember. Oh, no, there was lots. Um, there still were lots. Yeah. Because oh, the, the, one of the best lecturers who came on, he did he, history of cruise ships, and he was fascinating. Because the QE2 was Cunard, and then we worked for p &O, so we did when Oriana first came out. Probably the old Orion, I think we've got a new one now. But we were on there when it first sailed, so we did a six-month for the first time it was out. So every port you went to, it was new for that ship. So every port came out and there'd be flags, and as you left, there'd be fireworks and ceremonies. It was wonderful. We went to Maine, because we came all down the, the, the coast, um, Quebec, all the way down there. In Maine, Bar Harbour in Maine. I'd never been to anywhere so beautiful. Have you been there? I have. Oh, my God, it was so lovely. And I remember, I've, I've probably got the photograph of me with the plastic bib of <laughs> the lobster on it. With the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> it was just new experiences everywhere you went. We went to Mombasa, um, where we did the, we actually did a safari from Mombasa. That was so wonderful. All these things, I didn't even know a lot of these places. I knew they sort of existed from geography lessons or TV, but the, actually seeing them, oh, wonderful. Now, how did they, they didn't have tenders, did they back yes, then? Yes, oh, yeah. They that used they the lifeboats. On the ship? Yeah. Oh, they just used the lifeboats? Yeah, because um, well, the QE2 was quite big, so a lot of the, especially the small Caribbean islands, like St. Thomas, we always had to anchor quite a long way. And, and tend it in. But, they, yeah, they used the lifeboat, so... And you knew they'd work. <laughs> then then you knew whether or not if you needed them. Yeah, they were in working order. They were working. <laughs> so what else in your life has been just a fabulous experience? Well, I've so many, because we've been so lucky. Because I was saying to you, I never planned anything. I just sort of was offered a job. Oh, yeah, OK, I'll go for that. And then offered an... Oh, OK. And then Tony said, oh, fancy cruising. So, OK, let's see. So you work towards something, but I've never sort of craved. I've, I've had friends in the past who desperately want to do something or be somewhere, and it doesn't happen. So then they're disappointed. So I've never been disappointed because I've never really longed for something, I suppose, in a way. I've been happy with my lot, I suppose. And then we were very lucky. When we went on to Seabourn, um, you couldn't just go on as the guest entertainers because that was such a small ship. There's only 200 guests on there. You met astronauts and Lady Bird Johnson and you met people who are so interesting. That was all, everything was just fabulous. And then when we worked, and then we started to do P and O, and and then we thought maybe we should go home for a while and for some real life because we'd worked for so long. And we were doing we did six month contract on the Greek ship. One week at home, then nine months <laughs> on seaboard. And then we kept going, kept doing this. And then we said, maybe we should have some time at home for reality. And I think we stayed at home for about a year and thought, we don't like reality. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a dull and <laughs> yeah, reality is so boring. <laughs> but Tony, because he'd, when we were on seaboard after a while, I said, oh, do you know what? I, I need a bit of space at home. But they offered him the cruise director's job. So he said, well, he knew the ship and he knew the people. So he did that for about a year, maybe. Um, and that, obviously I kept going on with him. But I was still singing at home, so not as, I couldn't go on as often. But he enjoyed that. Um, so when he came home and then we went off and did a bit more ships again. But then we got at home and thought, oh, really, really, we can't do this anymore. We've really got to be away. So he sent out his CV and then luckily Azamara... Um, contacted him and said, oh, um, do you think you could come to Miami for an interview? Oh, all right then. <laughs> and by this time I was, I'd sort of settled into things at home. But I said, oh, well, if you're on there, I can just come off and have fabulous cruises. But it was really hard at first because we'd been together 24 hours a day for many years. So he went off to do that and that was really hard. 
So I thought, well, I'll just have to cut the work back at home, work really hard, and then I can go away for a month and be on the ship with them. So that worked perfectly. And then gradually the work at home, I was getting older, the work at home was getting less. So I thought, oh, you know, <laughs> just pack it in and then I can cruise with Tony all the time. And that's this last year I've cruised most of the time with him. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so it's so fabulous. So you can be together. Yeah. And you occasionally sing together. Oh, yeah, on, yeah. On the a ship, which yeah. is great. Because it was very funny. When we first came on, when he first came on Azamora, and I came on for a, a month, and he said, oh, you must come on at the end of my show, because he was just doing his show at first. Um, So I would come on and sing. He would do this spiel about being away, and I would come on and sing, you don't bring me flowers. <laughs> <laughs> And then we do a couple of other songs. And we used to always finish, in those days, we always finished with Endless Love, you know, that so very romantic. And I remember the first time we did it on stage and he came off and he said, do you know, that might be the last time we ever sing that song together. And then 10 years later, we were still singing that song <laughs> And we're still saying, yeah. you know. I'm yeah, it might be the last time we ever sing. <laughs> Tell me about retirement. What are you going to do? Are you at some point going to hang it up? And well, I what don't, would you do if you did? I'm, I'm retired now. I've always got lots of interests, so I'm never never get bored. And last year was the longest. It was the first time I'd done the whole four months. But it, again, it was the South American cruise. So that's a long flight home for us. Well, for anybody. So I brought on my laptop. I read a lot as well. I love doing puzzles, but I gathered at home, we had a bookcase, floor to ceiling, just photo albums from all, because in the days you got your photos developed, then you put the albums together and it took up and it was getting worse. But luckily now, then we went digital, which is a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful invention. So we decided to scan a lot of the photographs and then could we could throw a lot away and a lot of the albums could throw away. We had a whole bookcase to fill with books, which was wonderful. When I came on the ship last year, well, December 2018, I said, right, I'm going to sort these photographs out. 98,000 photographs. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, we kept, once you start, you've got a hard drive that you can back your photographs up on. So I also had lots of backups. So, that, oh, photographs everywhere. So that well, my mission will be to sort these out. So I've got my little space in the mosaic where I sat and sorted these out and the, the, the lovely waiters would come by and, oh, do you need a coffee? Oh, you need a... And they're just always hilarious that I had 98,000 photographs. And then I gradually got them, because they were all mixed up. So even though they were, they were in albums in Photoshop, and in, in iPhoto was then, I was taking them out and putting them in albums on the laptop. So I was then having to name everything dated and my memory is so bad so i'd find a photograph which had been scanned i'd say to tony i've no idea where this is where we were who, who, who are these people and oh well that was in such and such a need so i had to have had to keep a folder with things in tony to name <laughs> <laughs> oh album tony to name. yeah yeah the whole thing <laughs> but it was fascinating it was because it was lovely to look back on things as well and then I think, hang on, I haven't got the photos of such and such, so maybe they're still in the loft at home. Which, but then, but luckily, Tony has a really good memory, so he's vital to these sort of operations. Well, I have a job for you. Oh, go on then. You know what would be really good? Yeah. Is if you could write a blog uh -huh. about your experience and put some of those photos oh, right, right in the blog, yeah. and I'll put it on the website. Oh, that's an idea. Is that an idea? Well, yeah, really because I have to tell you, I not only have them in albums, I also have a spreadsheet in Excel. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Who says you're not planning ahead and organized? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm actually still doing, because, of course, we're, at, we're going to new places and we're still adding photographs. Yeah. So I have now got all in a, in a spreadsheet. So if I want to find something and, and everything's named, except a lot of family things... I've got children, like nephews and nieces, and then they've got like then great nieces. And I think, well, yeah, she was a baby then. So when was she born? So I'm yeah trying to date things, 
It's well, some of those difficult. old cruises. Oh my like god! Some of the pictures from yeah. those would be great. That would be cool block. to see the difference coming into yeah. Sydney. Yes. Yeah. All right. Oh, Think now I've got a that. mission. You do. <laughs> you don't need it today, though, do you? <laughs> no, not today. <laughs> Well, you've just been so much fun to interview. Oh, thank Have you. Got you. Any, any advice you would give for people that are thinking about doing this? I or? think we went one ship we did just 10 days on and we didn't know what to do. It was before the, the, the grief ship where we did six months and we thought, oh, well, they, they won't want sing-alongs and they won't that, this and that. And we didn't do well because we didn't have the right things we I mean we could sing and we had enough songs that could create an act but we weren't singing enough songs that they could join in with we learned watching the other acts on there because we'd never seen cruise ship acts we knew what to sing at home this is an international audience so we didn't know what they would expect so that was a learning experience for us so I would say every experience even if you don't do well on it learn from it and then, because we watched other acts and we talked to other entertainers and we said, oh, well, so how do you put things together? How do you know? And they say, well, talk to the guests on board and ask what sort of things. Because we had songs at home. We knew songs that we should have done, but we didn't bring all the music with us. Um, like sing-alongs, because they say, always put something in that will relax the audience so that they can sing along and join in. And then they relax something about well singing makes me it relaxes you so things like and you always want to have a big song in the middle somewhere so that then they can say all right and then they sit up again <laughs> and so it's a whole and you want somewhere where it's comedy not not tiny jokes because you I couldn't tell a joke to save my life but just something that's a, a funny song or what something do they call that it? kind of lifts them yeah up. So you and and she, she the one oh she's I think she's an agent now um in, in America Barbara, um and she gave us some really good advice like that and we thought okay so we went home learned from it, and then when we got this Greek ship we said to the agent okay what kind of audience is it like <laughs> we learned, and she said oh well you've got generally because it was mostly around the Greek islands and around Turkey, um so she said you've got a lot of Spanish speakers who go on there so okay so. That was, we were okay then. <laughs> we got it right. <laughs> and they like a mixture of songs, not just one type. You can do some, like, sort of Broadway type, or you can do general, like, standards, that, which was what I sang when I first started singing. But I would say always learn, never be put off when something doesn't work. Because even the best singers... We're lucky to with Tony working on the ship and I'm with him. So we get to know a lot of people. So quite often when you go on to do your show, you're singing to friends. So that and that makes it much and then you're more relaxed. And then they're more relaxed. And but, that makes it all yeah, all fun. Yeah. So I think basically just never be put off. If it's something you really want to do, you've got to just keep at it and learn. Learn from experiences and watch other people. And talk to other people. If you see an actor was really awful and they get a stand innovation, you think, why did, why did they get that? So you have to analyse what they did to get that. And you think, oh, so we didn't like them. So what was it that they were doing that the audience loved? And you think, oh, OK, yeah. It was the way they would sell a song or the way they would tell stories. Or So you learn from watching other people and from what other people say. So... That's about just don't be put off. <laughs> well, thank you, Christine. It's oh, been thank great you. talking with you. And we we hope you have many, many more lovely scenes. Well, thank you, Nan. I hope so, too. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We hope you're inspired to tell everyone about our podcast. Support our podcast by subscribing and shopping on our website, trailblazersimpact.com. And remember, you must learn a new way to think before you can master a new way to be.